Amen. Amen, church. Welcome once more. Glad you're here. Open up your Bible back to the book of John, uh, chapter 9. We're ready to start a new chapter. We finished chapter 8 last week, and now we're on to a new chapter, and fair warning once more. This is a very long chapter, not by verses, but because of what is implied in this chapter. So we're going to be exploring the depths of this chapter, as we've done this entire time, but we're going to be cutting it up into pieces, and although you really could preach through this chapter in one Sunday, you'll miss out on a lot of things going on within the chapter. And that's why we're here to really dig deep, go into the Word, learn from the Word of God, because that's what gives us life. So I know that you're not here for anything else other than learning from God's Word. And chapter 9, with all of its 41 verses, deals with one subject. And the big occurrence in this chapter happens within the first seven verses. And what's that big, miraculous job that occurs? The healing of the blind man, which the detail here is he was born blind from birth. It's a very important detail, and we're going to get into that. So this subject will be the entire overview of the chapter. And so the context of this chapter will see back to the original meaning of the Gospel of John. Remember when we started the Gospel of John, maybe you weren't here when we started the Gospel of John, but the Gospel of John really functions as a book of signs. It's a book that demonstrates the power of God in Jesus Christ. That's why the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this power of God is then demonstrated by what, Je what, what Jesus does throughout the entire gospel. So if you want to dissect or cut it in half, the first 12 chapters of the gospel of John deal with signs that Jesus does to affirm his calling. Up until now, what, we, what have we been learning and seeing? Jesus healing, Jesus doing miracles, and then we're going to talk about a chapter that goes extensively into the miraculous healing of a, of a person born blind. So all of this dealing with the focus that Jesus is who he says he is. It's the book of signs. It's pointing to Jesus as a sign that he is God. If we miss that, then we miss the entire meaning of the gospel. So it's important for us then to come back to this wonderful aspect of Jesus up two chapters more, two to three chapters more, and then Jesus will finally be persecuted. Jesus will finally be arrested, and then we're going to get into a moment in the Gospel of John where all we're going to be talking about is the passion of Jesus Christ, what he went through, what he's going through, the people that he had to confront while they were on the way to kill him. So this is very important for us up until now to know and to learn what these signs are pointing to. So this passage consistently calls for us to focus our attention on, once more, a big theme in John, light and darkness. And then now we have a person that is born blind, and so it gets to the really core of the issue. What Jesus has come to do is not necessarily heal, although that's his function to heal and to show his power, but more so to point people to the light. So here we have this wonderful story of Jesus healing the blind man. This passage consistently, as we'll see, calls him a man. The word that is used consistently throughout the chapter is anthropos, the means, which basically means man. But it's interesting that in verse 21, if you could just forward over there, this is just a brief overview of what we're going to be discussing. In verse 21, his parents call him of age. His parents are in the picture in verse 21, and they call him of age, which is helikian, which is basically the meaning of legal limit. You know, he's either between 13 years old and could be a full-grown adult. But the fact that they call his parents into the picture, you rarely call your parents into the picture when you're 
adult son is in trouble, right? It's usually when you have a teenager, even a young adult in trouble. So we could guesstimate that he's between 13, maybe I would push it to 25. However, they do call him a man, but it's interesting that his parents are involved here. So he's between those ages, and I just want to make sure that you know what we're talking about and who we're talking about. And so let's break up the Gospel of John Uh, chapter 9. Let's break it up into several sections. And I'm doing this so that it could prepare you for our study throughout these next several weeks. This is probably going to take us into the month of August, maybe even September, because we have a little bit of a break in July. But we're probably going to be going into the month of uh, August and September. So I want to make sure that you have a firm grasp on this so that you could go home and study this for yourself and to understand how we're breaking this up and what it actually means. So the first section that we're going to be discussing is the section of verses 1 through 7, which is basically what we're going to be looking at today. And even that section is going to get c- cut up, but I'll talk about that in a bit. That's the miracle section that we're going to be discussing, verses 1 through 7. That's one of the first things that we see right up in front of the gospel of chapter 9. And so this is where we get to see where Jesus, as we read, famously spits on the ground and makes mud to put on this guy's eyes. We've all heard that story, right? We've all remember that depiction and maybe even seen cartoons about it. But this is where Jesus spits on the ground and puts mud on somebody's face. we got to learn more about that. And so before he actually spits on the ground, he has to answer several questions. And one of the primary things that we're going to be dealing with today, he's going to answer the question about suffering. The concept of suffering, which we'll find in verses 1 through 5. And that's going to be our primary focus. But then, after that, we should expect three more levels of interrogation after the healing occurs in John. Especially in John chapter 9, after the blind man is healed, verses 8 through 12 is another section that we're going to be discussing. So maybe if you could bracket it off in your Bible so you can know how we're going to be breaking this up little by little. But in verses 8 through 12, there's an interrogation of, the, of his neighbors or of the common people that are around him. The people that were closely acquainted to him doubted what occurred. And so they had questions, and it's basic, basically the gossip of the town for that period. They could not believe that he had been healed. And so this comes into the picture at a stage where Jesus has already been doing this for a long time, or for a long time in that context. He's been doing this for several several years, and he's been demonstrating his power. And still we are confronted with people who doubt. Even if the people were closely acquainted to this person and knew that he had been born blind, So this is an interesting turn of events, but something that we should come to expect. This interrogation then leads up to another section that we're going to be discussing, which is verses 13 through 17. That's the other part. And here, he's brought before the religious group. This group that we constantly see in the gospel. It's these, it's the the group of the Pharisees who are constantly battling with Jesus. They, They hate him. And every time Jesus does something good, he's in trouble. And so we're going to keep discussing that and figuring out why this keeps happening, especially when it comes down to Jesus. And then later, in verse 18 through 23, his parents are brought into the picture, as we read in verse 21. And his parents are interrogated on his behalf. Like, is this really true? And they ask the parents this. And the parents, we'll see, are a little bit afraid to confront the truth, and so they'd say, hey, he's old enough to answer for himself. Why don't you go ask him? So those are three levels of interrogation that we're going to be discussing down the road, but I want to make sure you guys know that they're interrogating based off their lack of faith and unbelief in the person of Jesus Christ. And then after verses 23, we have a section between verse 24 through 34, which comes to a conflict between the young man and the Pharisees. 
Here's the young man before the religious group, and the young man says, man, I've already told you who healed me. I've already let you know what he's done. And they ask him if Jesus was a sinner and how could he do this. And, and so there's a big interrogation, but it leads to a moment of conflict where basically the young man is telling the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the time, look, the dude healed me. Regardless of what he is or what he's done, he's healed me and now I can see. And so it, it pushes the conflict to the Pharisees so much that it brings the Pharisees over to converse with Jesus. And at the final section, up into verse 41, then it becomes Jesus with the Pharisees. First, Jesus affirms the blind, the person that was born blind, and he affirms him, and then we see the reaction of that. And then he tells the Pharisees who's really blind. It wasn't the blind man who was really blind It's them. All making us aware that Jesus Christ is the light of the world and he has come to bring us salvation. So in a nutshell, that's chapter 9. And those are the brackets and those are the sections that we're going to be discussing. And there's so much to understand within each section that it, it would be very superficial to just kind of Say it and then move on to chapter 10, which is chapter 10 is one of my favorite chapter, chapters in the Gospel of John. But we really have to pause here and, and discuss. As a matter of fact, this is the only chapter in the Gospel that deals with one main issue. All the other chapters have been broken up and, and they have one story at the beginning, one story in the middle, and usually another one at the end. But this one is 41 verses all about one person. And you may think it's the blind man, but it's really about Jesus Christ. So... With that said, let's get to it, and let's get to work. In John chapter 9, we're going to go through the first section, which is verse 1 through 5, and I'll try to get all the verses in, but like I said, there's so much going on here that we really need to take our time with this. Verses 1 through 5 with a heavy focus on verse 1 through 3. So let's remind ourselves what these verses say, and then we'll get to it. Verse 1, as he passed by, this is Jesus, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Highlight that important detail, blind from birth. And then his disciples asked him, in verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So that question becomes very important. That's, that's a big bracket right there on your Bible to say, why are they asking this question? In verse 3, here's the answer. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So we'll pause there to further our understanding in these brief verses. So here we have the detail that is given to us and provided to us by the writer. This man was born blind. Now, often, this is why we we, we do this in church, to kind of get you guys into this this study mode when you actually read your Bible, to take some breaks and, and ponder a bit to see what this really means. He was born blind, and oftentimes as we read it, we could just kind of forget about that and say, oh, this is another miracle that Jesus did. But what does that really mean? On one level, John can be alluding to a spiritual connection with the blind man being born blind. And then all of those who are born spiritually blind, like the rest of us. That could be one way of seeing it at the beginning. But one of the main issues here is dealing with the physical aspect of being born blind. Here is where the tension begins to arise. Here's where we can really feel what it means because we have all been exposed to suffering. Now, you may not have been born blind. You don't know what being blind means. Maybe you don't even know someone who is blind. So that can just kind of be rushed through as you read Scripture. 
But any parent, any father, any mother would have an immediate reaction to this, especially if their firstborn child is born blind. What would be the reaction of a parent, of a father and a mother? It would be a very difficult, very kind of looking at God with awe and saying, God, why did you allow this to happen? There would be a theological battle within. You would be tore up. How do you deal with this issue? And maybe you know people that have, have, have had a child born by an, or with some other sickness, and you ask yourself, what, what's the cause of this? What happened here? And you, and you begin to hear the disciples in the background. Jesus, who was, who's at fault here? And, and you begin to kind of see how they try to reason with this. But there is this tension that occurs. How can God allow this? It's a baby. How can God allow such suffering from the womb and even live this person or this man in chapter 9 will have to live the rest of his life blind? Now, it's a difficult tension. It's a difficult theological crux that you're confronted with. What do you do here? Is God all-powerful or is he not all-powerful? Is God loving? If so, shouldn't God have healed this blind man? Shouldn't he have never let him been born blind in the first place? These are things that you begin to deal with as you're confronted. And that's why the Bible mentions that one detail. He was born blind. There was a lot of blindness in the first century, primarily because hygiene was a big issue. So people got infected with eye disease and and they were blind afterwards. But, But the issue here is that the person was born blind. So we have to answer that question. And we have to see how the Bible answers that question for us. It could be a very personal thing that we want to confront, but we have to answer it biblically. So the disciples, in the back of their mind, in order to exempt God from such a horrible uh, answer or such a horrible response on behalf of parents and on behalf of many, most Jews believed that all who suffer in life or all who are born like this are born this way because of sin. Yes, even babies. So the early Jews, even stemming from the Old Testament, the early Jewish community, to exempt God from such a horrible decision, would say that even babies in the womb would sin and therefore are worthy, in this case, of receiving this sickness. They would use to an understanding a bit the story of Jacob and Esau in Genesis chapter 25, verse 22. Remember the, the, the battle that was occurring with the twins in, the, in their mother's womb. And even Jacob comes pulling at the, at, at the ankle of Esau. And, and there was always tension in this from the beginning. And so a lot of the Jewish people reacted in such a way where they said, well, it's the baby's fault. The baby sinned. And that's why we get this question. So I want you to have that question in the back of your mind. And so as the disciples ask this, what do they say? Verse 2, who sinned? They look at Jesus and they say, Rabbi. And they they mention the name Rabbi because you got to teach us this, Jesus. Teach us what this means. Who's at fault here? Is it the baby? Is it the man? Or was it his parents? Or possibly his grandparents and back? Because it's kind of the understanding that they had. Plenty of the Old Testament passages would support this way of thinking. But a lot of the Jews still avoided the fact that Jesus was present. So now we got to see the Old Testament passages in light of Jesus. And so as we understand them, we'll get a better 
uh, developed idea of what it really means to suffer biblically. So, to understand this then, how do we do it? How do we figure this out? Well, we have to answer the question, first off, why are the disciples asking this question? So we kind of have a general understanding. They're asking this question because they have a belief that one or the other sinned. So how did they get there, and how did they develop that theology? It's always interesting to ask somebody, what do you believe in, and how you believe it? So if, you, if you ask somebody, why do you believe in going to church? Uh, my parents go, I, I, think it's, I think it's good for you, or what do you believe about God, or what do you believe about certain things, or certain issues in life? And it's interesting to hear what person would say. So here, we have to understand why these disciples are asking this question and how it will benefit us in our development of a theology of suffering. So we'll do this in part because most of us understand what suffering really means. So it's important that we get it right. How we react to suffering, in most cases, also reveals to us what we believe about God. It's interesting to hear somebody pray when they're in their worst moments. It's interesting to hear somebody pray when they're sick or when they lost to something or someone. You get, to, you get to peek in to their belief system a bit, especially when they're praying, especially when they're expressing themselves before God. The problem in many cases is that we live in such an influential, culturally relevant time that culture has, one way or another, influenced our theology of suffering. Which is why we, as Christians, have to come to the Bible and get an understanding of what the Bible says. Because there's a lot of ways or interpretations about this, especially in our modern day with this belief system of critical race theory. If you don't know what that is, ask any university student what critical race theory is, and they'll give you an understanding of what that means. But at a basic level, shifting the blame to current systems and current abuses and oppression by the oppressors of the past. And so exempting every present action from personal responsibility because it's all caused by another person, or in this case, another race. And that's why we find, or that's the answer that the United States, or in many cultures, have given to say, this is why Latinos suffer. This is why African Americans suffer. This is why we all suffer, because we are not of a certain race. And that's their interpretation, and that's their answer. And so what becomes difficult is when the Christian tries to say, hey, yeah, that's, that sounds right. Yeah, I've, I've felt, I've experienced that. My family has experienced that. And so we fall in. But we fail to understand that there is a theology of suffering, especially within the context of the Bible. I, I don't know if you paid attention during COVID, but we actually had a series on the Book of Lamentations. And we went through the Book of Lamentations very quickly. All five chapters we did in a couple of weeks. But it's a book in the Bible that's called Lament. It's about suffering, which in one way or another should prepare us to understand that God knows that we suffer and that we will be exposed to suffering. And how we deal with that will reveal to us what we believe about God. It's also interesting to note that the biggest category in the book of Psalm, and if we understand the Psalms, there's 150 chapters, a lot of them are songs to be sang in the congregation, and the biggest category of Psalms are of lament, of crying, of suffering. So there is a real expression in the Bible about suffering. So let's understand it in stages. 
First, if you want to put some categories here in your brain or in your notes, one of the first interpretations we have to get through is this pre-exilic interpretation on suffering. People suffer in the Bible, and there was a certain way to interpret that in the beginning. For instance, the pre-exilic time, before Assyria, before Babylon, before the Persian army, before all of this, uh, all, all of the, the, the Israelites were captured and then finally destroyed, there was this pre-exilic moment, which we have with some of the early patriarchs of our faith, and we could even go back to the pre-exilic time of Genesis chapter 1. This is the creation and the fall interpretation. So people that lived within this time frame in the Bible understood suffering primarily because of creation and fall. God perfectly created a world that was ultimately destroyed due to sin. And so from then on, it opened the door to pain and suffering. It is this basic theology or etiology, which is the belief, the beginning belief of why the world actually suffers. The answer is a simple answer. In the pre-exilic time, they thought it was because of sin. And so because God did everything good, humans are at fault and therefore are responsible to bear the pains of suffering. Everyone then is vulnerable to suffering. And now they have to take it as part of the consequence of being a human. So that's a pre-exilic interpretation. That's how many people in the Old Testament saw things. Now, are there some things that are correct in this? Is there some things that are at, at, at fault? Well, remember, we still have to see this in the light of Jesus Christ. Because though they anticipated a Messiah, they didn't have him. So how do we, how do we fit, fit that and how do we understand that? So this is just an explanation of what people believe. And then they also believed, the people in the pre-exilic time, they also believed that it was a generational cycle. For instance, we get this concept of the sins of the fathers in the prophetic times and even in the book of Exodus where they point back to the sins of their fathers and say, we suffer now because of what our fathers did in the past. That's why we're suffering. And so as mentioned above, in, in the creation and the fall, we find this fall to be an indirect approach to suffering. Suffering in this case is not directly on the personal offender, but on someone who has previously done the offense. And it also means that it's a corporate matter because it's not just one particular person, but now it affects the entire nation, avoiding the infliction upon the original perpetrator. So this is that, that thing from the past. It's that chain of, of understanding. It's not my fault, but it's the faults of our fathers that we are in this situation. Where do they get this from? In Exodus chapter 34, they understood it like this. Chapter 34 verse 6 says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So there is this cycle. The fathers sinned, the children and their children's children will reap that suffering. Once again, Jesus is not in Exodus, although maybe typologically he is, but he's not there. And there isn't an understanding yet developed of what the Messiah will actually do. But you got to remember, this is the people, this is how they lived in pre-exilic times. This was their theology. 
Even the prophets of the pre-exilic time like Amos and Hosea and Micah and even the pre-exilic prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel that lived in the pre-exilic time but also were carried over into exile. So they understand both parts, being free and being taken away. Even in these times, the, the prophets would scream and would preach what they received from God to warn the people of coming judgment. And so what was the function of the prophets? The prophets would basically warn the people and say, don't behave that way because if you do, judgment is coming upon you. So the prophets began to move the theology of cycle from the past and they started little by little moving into a deeper understanding of, hey, sin and judgment go hand in hand now. You can't blame the judgment or the suffering on somebody else and excuse yourself from that suffering or from that judgment. What do the prophets do? They say, turn away. Turn away from your sin and come back to God. So this suffering within the prophets was a development that was beginning to occur in the pre-exilic time about Learning to obey to avoid suffering. So what began to get tied together was that suffering was based then on disobedience to God's word. Even in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 15 through 20, the, the, they rediscover this in the times of Josiah. And in rediscovering this Deuteronomic principle where it says, choose life. Jesus, uh, Yahweh is telling them, choose life. It says, if you obey my law and you obey my commands, you will have life. But if you don't, you will have death. And then Yahweh says, choose life. And so the prophets began to develop this and bring this back so that, they, so that everyone in Israel and in Judah could understand that suffering to a certain extent will come because of sin. Even in Joshua's case, in Joshua chapter 7, we read of this person, Akan, and the sin of Akan, which was he stole money and didn't give it back. He stole it when God has specifically said, do not take anything for yourself after the battle. And he stole it and he brought condemnation and judgment over all of Israel because of the act of one person so this act now of sin will also affect and cripple the nation it isn't just a on a personal level so what does this all mean on the pre-exilic understanding of suffering well one of the things that we could draw from this understanding is that suffering primarily is a result of human sin but there's complexity to this it isn't that easy you got to understand, if we go back to Genesis chapter 3, God and the humans are not the only actors in the story. There's someone else there. Someone else is present when evil enters the world. Who is this that we are referring to? The snake. Now, it's interesting that in Genesis, it's, the snake never gets developed into this big concept of Satan or the devil. But he acts in such a way as the father of lies. And the snake is the force of evil that pushes the people to sin. Why this evil creature exists boggles the mind. Especially in God's great good garden. Why is he there? We don't know the answer completely to that question. What we do know, however, is that there isn't a concept of cosmic dualism where there is an eternal good and an eternal bad, a yin and a yang. There isn't cosmic duality here because the creature, the Bible says, clearly is still a creature and God is still God. What does that teach us and give us a foretaste of? That God still is in control 
over sin and over the devil himself. And so though we are tempted and though sin can produce sinful consequences on each other, what I don't want you to leave here with today is saying, oh, well, I think that we are exempt from, from suffering due to sin if I got it right. Well, no, that's not the case. Because there is consequences to every person's action. However, in light of a pre-exilic understanding, which is kind of what the disciples had when they asked Jesus this question, we should not fear that we are damned to suffer eternally because we have Jesus Christ. And though suffering, as the Psalter often says, only last for a night, joy comes in the morning. And so there is a way to begin to interpret and see and understand a theology of suffering when we bring Jesus into the picture that will not exempt us ourselves from sin, but will promise deliverance from our sin by a great Savior. What you will know is that the, prom that the promise the Bible gives us will never promise us to be exempt from suffering. That's clear here. And we'll see this next week and the following week. And as we discuss the theology of suffering, it will be evident that we will suffer. But we have Jesus Christ that has promised a moment in time that suffering will no longer exist. Suffering for eternity will no longer exist for those who are in Christ. So I thank you, church, for hanging in there in the first section of the theology of suffering. And next week, we'll pick it up in the exilic period and post-exilic period and their understanding of suffering. So why don't we rise this morning. You hung in there. That was good. Next, in a couple weeks, we are going to go back to our regularly two-hour preachings just wanted to make sure you were awake for that. Yeah, Julian, I got you in the back, brother. You, you gave me a round of applause, but just wanted to make sure you were awake. Uh, now, we'll go back to normal in a couple of weeks, but this is great. I want you guys to really understand what the Bible says about suffering before you begin to believe everything on YouTube and on Facebook. So let's pray. Father, thank you for reminding us that even in the midst of our suffering, you are God and you are good. Teach us how to look to you even in the midst of suffering and allow us to be the light of the world in, in, as a church, a city on a hill to those who have no answer to their current dilemma and current issue. Although we don't have an answer, we have the direction to point to the person who does hold the answer in his hands. And so, Father, we walk out in encouragement knowing that Jesus Christ is with us. And Jesus Christ will bring all suffering to an end. In heaven, as your word depicts, there is no hospital, there is no sick. You are the healer, and you are the one that will comfort all. And so the picture of heaven we have is of joy and of rejoicing. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. I'll see you here next week.